Brazil has come from being a Portuguese colony uh, to being a, a vibrant, though imperfect, constitutional uh, democracy. Uh, but human rights are still widely and regularly violated. This is because Brazil's uh, structures are still deeply marked by social authoritarianism, which reflects a scenario of poverty, exclusion, inequality, and violence. More human rights progress is therefore dependent on deep-rooted structural changes and human rights defenders have an important role to play in this regard. There, there is thus uh, a need for a new project of sociability towards effective citizenship, which reflects the urgency for human rights defenders to lead the way towards socially constructing a human rights uh, culture in the country. The violence involving uh, militarized policy affects mental health negatively. Comprehensive health is not possible without the realization of the right to mental health. Police violence directed to vulnerable communities has always been part of Brazilian society. But things have become worse since the parliamentary coup of 2016 and the correspondent new fascist uh, threats to Brazil's fragile uh, democracy. The right to comprehensive health imposes three levels of obligations uh, on the Brazilian state. Brazil has never, nonetheless been incapable of realizing its tripartite obligation to respect, to protect, and to fulfill the right to mental health in the context of militarized policy in marginalized communities in the country. This is a serious uh, problem that interests scholars, policymakers, human rights defenders, and especially favela residents who have been victims uh, of uh, militarized policy, such as uh, Manguinhos, Complexo do, do Alemão, and uh, Maré communities in Rio de Janeiro, uh, Brazil. The film, It Marked My Life a Lot, uh, Brazil slash UK 2022, addresses uh, the issue of militarized policy and its negative effects on the mental health of favela uh, resi uh, residents in Brazil. It is thus very important for our discussions uh, today. The link to the film has already been sent to participants to the side event. Uh, now, the panel is going to debate on state violence, militarized policy, and the mental health in Brazil. To do so, we have invited the following speakers to whom I say thank you for accepting the invitation. Vanessa Francisco Salles, human rights defender and one of the leaders of the resistance against police violence in Complexo do Alemão, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Bruna da Silva, human rights defender and one of the leaders of the movement Redes da Maré in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Ana Paula Oliveira, human rights defender and one of the leaders of the movement Mothers of Manguinhos in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Chivon Wills, uh, director of the Transitional Justice Institute at Ulster University and co-director of the film, It Marked My Life a Lot. Diogo Cabral, human rights defender and the lawyer of the Bon Acerto community that has experienced high levels of police violence in Balsas City, Maranhão, Brazil. And Luis Lopes Silva, history professor at the Federal University of Maranhão and representative of Maranhão Human Rights Society, as well as Network of Security Observatories, Maranhão, Brazil. Let's start our, our discussions uh, with Vanessa Salles. Vanessa, the floor is yours. 
Bom dia. Good morning. I am a mother. Agatha is unfortunately no longer amongst us because she unfortunately was murdered when she was coming home from an outing, an excursion with myself. So it's now three years. It will be three years soon that my daughter is no longer with us. A girl with so many dreams. And I myself had many dreams for her. And unfortunately, they will not become a reality. Agatha was a girl who was loving, even though she lived very, a very short life. Eight years on this planet, and I become moved when I speak of her. I am proud of my daughter, the same way any mother would be proud of her child. But Agatha was a very special gift in my life. I didn't want to be a mother, but I thought that mothers, that being a mother was too much responsibility. But when God gifted me with Agatha, I was taught the blessing of childhood. And I learned to care, to love more, to dedicate my time to her and to myself. Because we mothers, we think that when we have our children, we have to become live for our children but that's not the case we have to live for ourselves so we can make their lives happier so we learn to take care of ourselves to take care of them me and agatha became partners for life everything that i needed to be at agatha wanted to be with me and she understood that when she couldn't come with me that there was a reason but she had her own activities agatha was a ballerina um uh, at age six, she took English classes. And at seven years of age, Agatha was speaking English, not fluently, but she understood so many words and she was putting sentences together in English. Agatha could have been a ballerina. She was recognized as having extremely special posture and of being um, more mature than her age so she understood the dance at the age of seven agatha was very intense and she knew how to use her intensity in life she understood that her father had been with us for some time but then he needed to work and then he would spend she would spend time with me she knew how to to uh take advantage of the time she had of her father and enjoy his presence when she was with him and then be with me when she needed to. She could have been what she wanted to be because myself and Gilles, her father, worked hard to give Agatha a brilliant future. Everything that we were unable to have in our childhood because of, you know, our parents' trials and tribulations we know that times are difficult but if you don't fight if you don't uh, persist you're unable to reach your goals so i agatha made me strong she made me want to be more persistent so i could give my daughter the best fortunately in 2019 agatha was taken from me very cruelly she was in my arms she was taken from my arms. So Agatha was always with me. And at the time of her death, she also was with me. Agatha's here with me still. I am someone that tries to face life peacefully with a light heart. And I understand that wherever Agatha is, she can see me and she is happy if i keep living if i keep fighting if i keep being determined to live on this planet and fulfill the role that i was unable to fulfill with her it wasn't my fault it wasn't anything that i did so it was only because of the circumstances of our lives but i won't give up i won't I will continue with my head held high. And today I am here telling you that we, the mothers who have our children cruelly taken from us, taken from our laps, from our arms, we need to be centered. We need to be focused. And we need to know that our children, they want not only our fight, but they want our well-being. They want us to stand in peace and 
to be strong so we can continue fighting against the cruelty in this society. If I only look at the cruelty, I will give up. I won't be able to keep my head held high. I will be sick, I will be depressed and uh, extremely uh, diseased by what happens in the world. I understand today that I have to wake up and I have to be healthy because God reminds me, God is my strength. And I believe that to stand strong, I had to concentrate my mental focus on the creator because he is larger than any circumstances in any context and he is the one who gives me uh the strength to be here speaking to you i'm not wearing a shirt of agatha or a picture a photo of her on my t-shirt because it's so difficult and painful for me i respect all the mothers i respect the mothers that do want to wear the shirts i think we need to wear the shirts and remind people of the faces of our children if we don't raise their names who will ever raise the names of these children so I'm not wearing the shirt because it pains me too much at the moment. We have the voices and we have to be the voices of our children who lost their voices. And we are the voices of the other mothers that are not here, but who we are representing here. And I want to vibrate love, light, peace, and strength strength because we need strength and determination to get out of bed every day and see that our life was turned upside down but we will continue here regardless of the fact that our life was turned upside down we will not remain turned upside down we will stand and we will turn our lives around and lift our voices raise our voices to say that's enough that's enough. I'm sorry, I can't talk about this without crying. When I say her name, when I say Agatha, I always remember her and I cry. But regardless of the tears, I must keep speaking. I need to be the voice of my daughter who lost her chance to speak. I want to tell you about her. She was determined. She was so intelligent. Agatha was a genius. She was scoring 10 in all of her math tests. She was seven. She was seven years old. She was she loved math. It was her favorite subject at school. And I'm so proud of that. Because we have no idea where that came from her passion for numbers. I know it wasn't myself or her father, but she had this ability to interpret text to interpret numbers. And I mean, it was a blessing. She was a blessing in our lives. I, I thank God for having been a part of her life, even if it was brief. And I know that I did the best that I could for my, my daughter's education, even living in a favela, even living in a community. People think that if we live in a favela, we don't value education. We don't know anything. We do. We value education and the favelas can be good places to live. I live in Complexo do Alemão for 35 years now. And for three years, unfortunately, I have living with the fact I have been living with the fact of the death of my daughter, I go home and I don't see her waiting for me. It's been only three years that I wake up every day, trying to do the best I can still because my daughter is no longer here and she was taken from by the people who should have been there to defend us by the people that should have been there to protect us as families it's painful and um it's consistently painful but we need to be determined thankfully i was blessed with faith i believe in god and he continues to give me strength without god i can't stand on my own i I, I always have to say that my faith is a blessing and I will always mention my faith and the blessing of having a spiritual life. That's the only reason I'm still here. That's, that's it for, for now. And I hope that, that we can one day 
reach the place we don't even imagine possible, where our voices, where our strength, where our tireless determination will pave the way to a better world and touching people's hearts so that they can come here and change the safety, the security policy in the favelas of Rio de Janeiro. I hope for change. I hope for concrete change to the policy. Change for all because everyone is has every everyone should have the right to a safe existence, to coming and going safely without having to fear stepping out of their houses. Sometimes people ask me, Vanessa, how can you go home every day? How can you leave your home every day and get to work? I have to. If I do not, who will do it for me? I need to scream. I need to raise my voice. If not, who will do it for me? My pain is constant. Sometimes I have peace, but it comes back. So it recedes and it returns because I, Bruna, Ana Paula, and countless mothers who go through this, unfortunately, will stay with that pain. I like to say that we we're potent, we're powerful, and the fact that we're here, we have to raise our heads high and we have to repeat, God is with us, I must keep fighting. If not, my health will become deteriorated. She was my only daughter. She was eight years old. Today she would be 11. Imagine the things we would have done together. Who has children here? Do you have children? Most people will have a child in their lives and I don't wish this on anyone. It's a pain that is so excruciating. Only the people that have spirituality and determination and strength will be able to make it through something like this. Many people used to tell me in the past, um, or, or people would say about me that I wouldn't manage, that I would probably become sick, that I would fall along the way, but that's not the case. And I want to tell the other mothers, your child didn't want to see you fallen along the way. So stand up, be strong, be the voice of your child. Be their chance to speak to the world. So I used to imagine so many things. Ana Paula used to imagine so much for Jonathan. Bruna used to imagine so much. But unfortunately, those dreams will never become a reality. But I do believe that wherever they are, wherever she is, I'm sorry, but I have to believe someone. I have to believe something so I can continue alive. So I chose to believe that she is in heaven, that she looks down upon me, that she cannot be with me physically anymore, but that she can look down on me, that she can exist in my memory, in my heart, and in my spirit. And I believe that the moments that we lived with our children continue to emanate energy through the universe so they can give us the strength. I believe that they're there interceding for us in the spiritual realm so that we can continue here. Sometimes at the end of a busy day, a stressful day at nine o'clock at night, when I get home, I look to the sky and I say, thank you, God, because I made it through this day. And I know that it was because of her. And unfortunately, the next day is another fight, but making it through the next day is what determines what you will be in life standing thanking god even if our children are not by us physically there are other people that have gone through worse things than us i know we have health i am healthy anna is healthy bruna is healthy what about the mothers who have fallen along the way who unfortunately could not raise their heads uh, what about the mothers who have committed suicide because of the pain or are bedridden and cannot stand. I don't judge them because I understand the weakness. I understand the pain. I understand the possibility. It's knocking at our door, but I want to encourage you to 
choose to stand. It's what you choose to think in the morning when you wake up and get out of bed and how you pull through that mental battle is what helps you understand that you want to do better every day. I like to say that I want to be better every day to make my daughter proud of me. I do it for her. I do it for God and I do it for, well, I do it for her because she is my second greatest love. My first love is God. And that's one of the things that I told her about. I'm sorry, I apologize. On the week when Agatha was taken, that was one of the lessons I was starting to teach her. I would tell her, Agatha, I love you. But before my love, you need to love God. He will be the one to carry you through first God and then your mother and then your father. And she understood that lesson. Agatha was. Uh, today, I see it this way. She needed to be an angel. She was too good for us. So that's the way I choose to see it, that she was born with light. She is an angel and I will continue living. So I will continue here until God decides that my mission is over. When God says, Vanessa, your mission is overcome, then I will go. The only person that can choose is God. God is powerful. And I fear him and I respect him and I want to embrace all of the mothers that are watching us here. I wish you strength and power. It's difficult to be here, but it's necessary. It's necessary. Thank you, Vanessa, for your words. Um, feel our solidarity and your example of resistance and fight is extraordinary. Thank you, Vanessa. Now let's get let's give the floor to Bruna. Bom dia a todos e a todas. Good morning to all. My name is Bruna Silva. I live in the in the collective group of the favelas of Mare. I'm the mother of a son that was victimized and killed by the state of Rio de Janeiro. Just to correct what was said, I am not a leader of Hedges da Mare. I am a community leader and a, a represent a, a represent a, a strong community leader where I live. I am one of the founders of the Mães da Mare movement. I would like to tell you the story of Marcos. Marcos Vinicius was murdered in 2018 during an illegal police operation in the favelas da Maré. Marcos Vinicius was 14 years old. Meu filho saiu para ir para escola atrasado. My son left to school that day. He was late for school. And unfortunately, out of nowhere, there was a federal police operation at the favela and my son was used as a platform uh, for gunshots from a core a quadi helicopter my son tried to hide he thought it was just a passing helicopter that had shot a round of gunshots but when my son saw that the helicopter had stopped he left his hiding place and tried to make his way home being that on the street that we live in, there was an armored car. I saw the core police armored car stopped in the middle of the street. My son stopped and he said to his friend, let's go back because there's an armored car there and you know what happens when we walk in front of an armored car. When, since my son, uh, it's, when, when he started turning around to move back toward the house, he there was a gunshot was fired at his lower back and it crossed to his belly marcos vinicius tried to rescue himself at the age of 14 he ran into the car of a resident of the favela asking for help that resident took my son to the health unit um, risking his own life because he was going through police blockages, armored cars. It was a federal intervention. So this man risked his life to take my son to the health unit. Marcos Vinicius, this young boy, a dreamer, 
a genius at math. He loved to study geometry and he loved the Portuguese language. It was one of his favorite subjects at school. As a mother, I think that I did a good job in my son's life. My son always used to tell me, mom, you are my strong arm. You are my warrior. You are my friend. And I was his strong warrior. I was his friend. I was his confidant at 14 years of age. We would chat about everything. He would tell me everything about school, about problems. His father was present, but I was his mother. Mothers are mothers. And the state, which should have cared and protected my son, took my son from me. I ask myself sometimes, you say out there that the favela is a dangerous place, a place of drugs and criminals. Favelas are not places of drugs and criminals. It is from the favelas that the future of this country is born or should be born. From, this fa from these favelas, people go to the houses of their bosses in Zona Sul to solve the lives of these people. We're the ones who make the wheels of this country turn and we're treated as criminals. We clean your houses. We go to your homes and solve your problems. Marcos Vinicius, he said, he asked me, mom, didn't they see that I was wearing my school uniform, that I had my backpack? He asked me, didn't the armored car see that I was just going to school? They did see my son, but they see us all as the same. I say, and it's not my, not only myself who says this, but I say this about all the mothers. We were able to protect our children from the parallel powers. Unfortunately, we were not able to protect them from the state powers, from the police agents who should have protected and supported them. The state, sometimes we protect our children from crime, but we are unable to protect them from the state. The state is killing more than cancer in the favelas. Unfortunately, we are mothers that, well, we fortunately have been able to be reborn from our pain. But what about the other mothers who fall along the way because they don't have the patience or the strength to wait for the justice system, which is tardy. Yesterday was the birthday, the anniversary of my son's death. Yesterday, it's been four years that he was taken from us, that he was murdered. Yes, last today, four years ago, unfortunately, I was at the, my, my son's burial. So today is a very difficult day. It's the day of my son's burial, the day after his death. And it's a, a, a film, a movie that plays in my mind. Today, if Marcos Vinicius was still here, he would be 18 years old. I was crazy. I was waiting to see his beard be born, but the state did not let me see him go through his first relationship, his first uh, everything. Today, me and Marcos are still together because we understand that we need each other. My family has been strong for me and my family needs to be strong because it's not only for for our children, it's for the ones that are still here. But we need answers. We need answers for our sons. We can't be ignored anymore. Because with no peace, there is no calm. And with no calm, there's no peace. And then disease starts to erupt. Today, I am someone who is lighthearted. I consider myself to, to be going through the healing. But I do know that my sleep will never be the same way it was because when we lose a child to police violence, we have anxiety. We want answers quick and they are as slow as they can. Justice system is as slow as they can be with the cases of our children. And we don't have time to wait. We need justice. We need answers. We want public security systems and police forces that 
protect us. We don't want to see the police going into our homes and behaving this way. The state needs to be monitored. The state needs to be audited. You can't just let the state step into the favelas and do whatever they want. If you're going to put the state in the favela, I want to see you monitor what they do up here. I want to see them answer for what they do up here. We are the mothers that were reborn from our pain. And as long as we're alive, we will continue to claim for the rights which were denied to our children and to the children of our children. We will continue the fight. We won't give up because we believe that from this nation, a better nation could be born. We still believe that a better nation can be born. Even though the president of this country right now is a genocidal man, the state kills and he can decorate the officers. He makes these deaths legitimate. Every state agent, policeman who murders someone needs to be held responsible, needs to answer for his acts. And I hope to leave you with these words. And I hope that you hear my voices and you hear the voices of the other mothers and that these voices can echo around the world and that we can have an answer. Because today at 8.30 in the morning, there is an operation in Rio de Janeiro. We cannot stand to wake gunshots with violence, see mothers crying because the state has killed their children. <clears throat> That's not the role of the state. The role of the state is to assure our rights, especially the right to life. And who has taken our lives inside of the favela and outside of the favela is the armed forces of the state. So with that, I, I will thank you for inviting me here. I hope I, I haven't um, been, gone over time too much and um, we're fighting together. Thank you. Thank you, Bruno. Um, feel our solidarity in your fight and in your resistance. Bom dia, gente. Good morning. É, bom dia para quem pode ter um bom dia. Good né? morning for those who have a good, who are having a good morning. Unfortunately, here in Manguinhos today, the morning did not start very well. We woke up with a police operation started at 5 a.m. today. So the police came up here. They are wearing their hoods. We can't see their faces. They came up in the armored cars. So I can't really say good morning today, unfortunately. But I do wish you a good morning or a good day wherever you are. And when I, I, I joined this video call, um, Ulysses asked me if my family was well, if everything is okay. Up until now, yes, I hope that by the end of this meeting today, we will still be safe. My name is Ana Paula Oliveira. I'm 45 years old. I live in the favela of Manquinhos, a favela which is in the north zone of the city of Rio de Janeiro. I am a mother of two children, Jonathan and Maria Paula. Unfortunately, my son, my oldest, Jonathan, in 2014, at 19 years of age, was taken from me. He was murdered by the police in Manguinhos. My son was murdered with a gunshot to his back. He was coming back from his girlfriend's house in Manguinhos. Difficult, but I want to tell you, Jonathan, I want to show him to you. He has a face and I'm wearing his face on my shirt. I do like to wear and show my son's face. Fortunately, this beautiful boy, who I'm so proud of having been his mother. This is my son, Jonathan, also a boy that was full of dreams, a boy who loved to live. He loved being alive. He loved animals, he loved dogs, he loved children, and he was very loved. Was no, he is very loved. We still love him. And all of those who had the privilege of being a part of his brief life 
love him till today. Jonathan is loved by his relatives, by his friends. He's missed by all. Jonathan is loved by the neighbors. Up until today, it's been eight years since Jonathan was murdered in 2014. But uh, till today, people will stop me in the street. Our neighbors, our old neighbors, everyone who had been through his life, who had met him, they'll always come, they'll cross the street, they'll hug me and they'll say how much they miss him. They'll remind me of stories or memories or moments they spent with Jonathan and how he was a loving boy, how he was a well-educated boy, how he was a polite boy. <clears throat> Unfortunately, regardless of that, he was taken from us. He was taken in a very unexpected, and brutal way from our family. Fortunately, this is, we, 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 live, we, we live this pain every day. Fortunately, it hasn't stopped at our children. I want to embrace Vanessa and Bruna and say that. <coughs> and I also want to thank them. Thank them for being such strong women, for us not from that. So I don't feel alone in this fight. I want to thank these women for standing by our side. It's not an easy, an easy battle to pick, but it's necessary. Unfortunately, our children will not come back. No matter how, how hard we fight, unfortunately, justice will probably not be met in our cases. We lost our children, but we fight for justice to happen for the children of other mothers. Justice for us is the guarantee to the right to life. That is the summary of justice to us. We want the children and the mothers to be able to continue living in harmony and peace, regardless of where they live or where they were born. That's what we fight for. 2014, when my son was murdered, I was cared for not only by the favela of Manguinhos and by its residents, but also by one special um, neighbor, Fatima Pinho. Fatima Pinho also had her son murdered by the police. He was 18 when he was murdered. Fatima's son, Paulo Roberto, was beaten to death by a police agents of the UPP of Manguinhos. UPP is what would they call the pacifying police units. It was a government project in Brazil to put police units in all the favelas. And it was also a police from the UPP, pacifying police units that murdered my son. Fatima's son was murdered seven months before my son, and she was the one who held my hand through it all. And she used a few words that I will never forget. She said, Ana Paula, I never gave up on him. And it's not now that I will give up on him. Let's unite our strength and let's fight for it. And from her, call from her cry, the Mães de Manguinhos movement was born. This is a movement where we embrace other mothers who have gone through what we're going through, are going through what we went through. This is a place where we, we hope to be the landing for these mothers, but we also hope to become, uh, help these mothers to become po political because they need to understand that this violence is not by chance. This is not, these are not stray bullets. There is no, this is not the war on drugs because if public security was really interested in fighting or, or the war on drugs, then it would go to the, bar to the borders of Brazil, it would go to the big farms where there are large plantations of cocaine, why don't they go there to exact their war on drugs? They would also be more, they would make sure that these guns and these weapons and these drugs don't get to the favelas. But they let the drugs reach the favelas and then they enact the massacre. Mass murders of this population that is the black, the vulnerable of this country. And it's not today, it's not, it hasn't started today. We have been exterminated by the public policies of this nation, public policy that is created 
to exterminate us? And who does this public policy exterminate women? The black population. The poor black population of this country are the ones that are being massacred daily in this country, that are daily being jailed in this country, that make up most of the population that is jailed or killed simply because of the color of our skin, because of the place we were born, because of where we live. And like Bruna said, unfortunately, not all of the mothers are able to have health or strength to continue resisting or survive after something like this. We know many mothers who <clears throat> were standing by our side one day and on the next and the next day became sick, depressed or died. I usually say that that's raising my voice in places like this and meetings like this is what has saved me because it's so much pain inside of us that if we don't have ways to externalize it, we wouldn't survive. So for me, raising my voice is important for my survival. I say that inside of my, my chest, side by side are the pain and the love for my son. So I need to talk about the love I have for him and the pain that the state has put in my soul. Unfortunately, not all mothers have this opportunity. Not all mothers are healthy enough to do this. So I usually say that if I don't externalize this, if I don't exter uh, say this, then I will end up dying. A lot of times people say, oh, you're so brave. You report police violence. You raise your voice against police violence. Believe me, if I did not, I would die. I think we'll die anyway on this planet. I'd rather die. I'd rather go down fighting. I didn't choose this. The state imposed this life on me when they murdered my son, a helpless boy with a gunshot to his back. And we, we need to be the voice of the mothers that do not have voice, that cannot speak, that were unable to speak. We owe it to them and we owe it to our children and we need to use the word racism. We need to call it what it is. It's the racism that murders us, that imprisons us and that violates our right to life. Racism needs to be fought. I, it's been eight years now that I've been raising my voice in this fight, in this fight for justice, for institutional justice, which should give us the answers. But I usually say that the courts of justice in this country are also places that are planned for tiring us. It's a place where we can't raise our voice, where we have to be quiet uh, while we we're facing the murderers of our children uh, as they lie. And we're, we have to sit through it all. We can't raise our voices because if we do, then that hearing, that public hearing, which took years to get, may be canceled, may be annulled. So we sit there and behave. But when we leave a public hearing about our, about our sons, we leave feeling even worse than we went in. So um, this justice system needs to be questioned. It needs to be called out. We need a justice system, which is actually just and just for all. The justice that we see in Brazil today is doesn't represent us. It has two different standards. And I like to say that it's not only the police agent who pulled the trigger against our sons that needs to be condemned or held accountable, but the justice system itself, which has our son's blood on its hands. This justice system, which doesn't fulfill its role. Thank you. Thank you, Ana Paula. Please feel our solidary embrace. Uh, I admire you. I admire your resistance and I admire you, all of you for what you're doing here. 
you want to use. Thank you. Thank you all. It's a great privilege to be here and to listen to Vanessa, Bruna, and Anna Paula sharing their very painful testimonies. I salute you, I admire you, uh, your strength and courage is, is such an, I, I don't have the words to explain how much I admire and how important it is, but I am here to say to the audience and to the UN and uh, human rights monitoring bodies that these voices, these testimonies, these mothers who are speaking, we need to take notice of what they are saying and embrace that and and integrate that into our human rights monitoring processes and into make, creating change in Brazil and globally. You will have understood from the speakers you've heard here today, the nature and scale of police violence in the less well-off neighborhoods in Brazil. It is as if the police are conducting a war against those communities. In Brazil, Police violence largely takes the form of militarized operations in which entire neighborhoods are occupied by military police or the army for five or six days, sometimes much longer. And as you will have heard from Anna Paula, this very morning when she was coming to speak at this webinar, she was delayed by another operation and had to take time to take her child to school, make sure she was safe before coming to speak here. What courage there is in that to come and speak to, to the global audience and to the UN on a day when she is worried about whether her child is safe because there are, there are police operations with guns in the streets right beside her. The neighborhoods in which these militarized operations take place are always the poor neighborhoods in which the majority population is black. And so we need to reiterate with what Anna Paula said, that this is racist policing. Heavily armored vehicles mounted with cannon guns are routinely stationed at street corners and the neighborhoods are routinely strafed with sniper fire from helicopters. Residents cannot leave their houses to buy bread or to go to work without risking their lives and children cannot go to school. On average, five people a day are shot dead by Brazilian police the highest rate of police killings in the world. And more than three quarters of those killed are young black men. As you heard from Bruna, mothers are able to protect their children from the parallel powers, the militias, but it is the state that they are finding really difficult to protect their children from. Whilst it is mostly young men that are shot, it is not only men that are killed. As Kristen Smith, argues understanding police violence in Brazil requires expanding our definitions of state violence. Black women are dying slowly from police violence, particularly after losing a child or parent in a police killing. You have heard from Vanessa, Bruna and Anna Paula of the huge challenges they and many other women face after their children are killed and also of the impact on their other children as the whole family struggles with grief, with the fight to memorialize their children and against the criminalization of their children since the police always claim that the child was involved in crime and somehow their death was their own fault. And then there is the stress of endlessly long, long cases, court cases, which never get resolved or if they do, the, it never, it takes years and then uh, the Bolsonaro may pardon the policeman anyway. Oh, this leads me to the question of the legal framing of violations of human rights in the context of excessively violent policing. There are many challenges to producing accurate data on the impact of police violence on human rights in Brazil, including suppression of evidence, falsification of facts and denial of accountability. But another key challenge is a lack of consensus on the criteria for determining who is a victim or survivor of police violence. There is a tendency for human rights lawyers and human rights fora to focus on police shootings, murder and rape, 
generally the most salient criteria from the perspective of a criminal law case. This is understandable, but it's important not to collect the more widespread violence inflicted without visible external wounds on women and children and the whole community. These less immediately visible violations of economic, social and cultural rights should also be addressed along with violations of the right to life by human rights bodies, especially where there is strong evidence that the impact of police violence on these rights was predictable. And it is clearly predictable that if police carry out a major operations with, from armor, using armored vehicles, cannon guns and snipers, that there is going to be, and do it routinely, frequently, that there is going to be an impact on the health of the whole community. On the, in particular on the mental health, but also the physical health, because they may be injured, but also the mental health of the mothers, the children, the brothers, the sisters, the whole community. The right to health, including mental health, as I've said, is routinely impacted by police violence, but it is underreported, understressed in human rights reports on police violence. Even though there is a strong body of evidence produced by community psychologists and psychiatrists that these impacts are clearly predictable and cause widespread deep-seated challenges to health for the residents of the entire communities. If the state took into account their obligations to protect the right to health, including mental health, of all the residents within their jurisdiction, including the residents of the poor neighborhoods that they frequently target with militarized policing, they would have to take into account reasonable evidence, and there is substantial evidence of the potential for those operations to violate the rights, the human rights of the residents, their right to health, which is an independent right that we all have. And therefore they would have to take into account that in their managing and directing of their police operations in their training and it would the un bodies uh, and local national monitoring bodies would also have to broaden their concept of who is a victim to take into account everyone within the community whose health including mental health may be compromised but while the un Mon human rights monitoring bodies acknowledge the mental health challenges that result from police violence, they tend to be addressed as secondary consequences rather than as a violation of the right to health itself as an independent right. Without health, the ability to live with freedom and dignity is compromised because everyone, adults, children, even babies, have their lives framed and curtailed by fear, anxiety, and constant precautionary activity that is not experienced by those of us who do not live in communities that are routinely targeted by police. Instead of worrying about school exams, children have to worry about sniper fire and what to do when a heavily armored police vehicle with a mounted cannon gun enters their street. Earlier this year, um, no, I just note that Brazil's National Observatory on Mental Health, Justice and Human Rights reports that in recent years in Rio's favelas, the levels of psychological stress that can be linked to police violence have reached almost epidemic characteristics. That is one body of report noting the levels of psychological harm, psychological compromise, but there are many others. Earlier this year, I interviewed UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Health, Dr. Klaalai Mofakeng, about the impact of police violence on the right to mental health. And I would like to play a short clip from her interview in which she highlights the racist nature of a high proportion of police violence. Alan, would you please play clip one? and people would rather maintain a system where they are beneficiaries, right, of inequality, as opposed to actually being intentional about ending the systems that deem others unable to access services, unable to access goods, unable to access a life-saving commodity, such as a vaccine, just certainly as an example. So these things, all of them are intersecting, whether it's police brutality, whether it's a policing methods, whether it's a continued harassment, uh, of children in the streets just trying to get to school, just trying to get back from school home. Um, you know, that, that, that witnessing of violence every day um, not only just impacts you as a person who then has to live under the fear of violence, but it also impacts your ability to concentrate in class, right? It affects um, your ability 
because many of these communities don't have mental health support, there is no access to psychologists, psychiatrists, um, there is no debriefing. The hospitals, the clinics, completely um, overflowing with other medical emergencies because they are physical. But mental health is a difficult one because people don't often see a wound. So it often gets shelved and it gets forgotten and no one ever comes back to actually assist communities, process what has happened to them, assist children especially with understanding and processing the trauma that they are living through. And they can't transition healthily right into adulthood. If you're a child or an adolescent who's living in a community um, that's ravaged by poverty, uh, food insecurity, crime, and now the added layer, right, of having elected leadership, people in governance, then using police methods um, that actually tell you that you don't belong here. You are not meant to be here. We don't value your life. Um, so where do people go? It's no wonder that no one feels free. And I think for me, um, for my tenure as a special auditor, I've always maintained that I would like my work to contribute to the restoration of dignity. And this is precisely why, is that many people are living um, in conditions that every single day are either experiencing rights violations or rights violations are being enabled by systems that choose to ignore them. I'll sum up my presentation with a plea to the international human rights monitoring bodies to do one, include economic, social, and cultural rights, including the right to health and mental health in your reports on police violence, and two, to inform states of their obligations to uphold the right to health when planning and conducting police operations. And the final point I would like to raise today concerns the impact of police violence on children's rights to healthy development, mental health and education. There is no time to discuss this in depth today. So I'll close with a short clip for an in, from an interview with Christos Boseris talking about the impact of Rio's militarized policing operations on schools, which highlights just some of the issues. And thank you for all for your attention. Alan, Alan, sorry, please play clip two. O calendário escolar para a criança pobre, ele é completamente fragmentado o tempo todo, seja a, a, a escola que está dentro da favela ou que está à margem da favela ou que está distante da favela. Né? É muito complexo porque num tiroteio da favela acabou aquele dia letivo, então é um dia que tem que ser riscado do calendário. Muitas das vezes, dependendo de quem é essa criança, de quem é esse profissional, ele perde essa semana, dependendo do grau de violência desse conflito. É um conflito que normalmente é, começa cedo ou pode ser durante o período do dia. Se começa cedo, essa escola não abre, então essa criança já fica sem aula. Ela fica refém desse conflito dentro de casa, com a sua família. Muitas vezes, quando dá para sair, a mãe vai trabalhar, porque o patrão não quer saber disso, e ela fica ali refém né, da sua própria direito de ir e vir, né, de tudo que ele está passando ali mentalmente, sozinho. Essa criança vai viver durante dias em traumas, né, com distúrbio de sono, ouvindo tiros que não está no mesmo momento de paz. Ele vai estar tá ouvindo tiro, a cabeça completamente chocada e traumatizada, porque, de fato, a gente vive uma situação de guerra. A gente tem crianças com depressão, né, que não, não frequentam diariamente as escolas. É, a gente tem escolas que foram invadidas pela polícia em momentos de aula por alguma questão e no cenário e essas crianças são impactadas diretamente. Mas a questão da saúde diretamente, a gente atende mulheres e crianças, casos gravíssimos de depressão, síndrome do pânico, por conta da violência geral. Tiroteio em momento que a criança está indo para a escola, tiroteio quando estão dentro de sala de aula, é, tiroteio no retorno para casa. Uh, thank you, Siobhan. Uh, now let's uh, give the floor to Diogo Cabral. Oi, bom dia. Bom dia a todos e todas no Brasil. Well, good morning to everyone joining us from abroad and Brazil. First of all, in the name of the Mariense Society of Human Rights, I would like to express my solidarity with the mothers that have gone before me, spoken before me, with very deep words, words that leave us 
wordless, speechless, and you know, it's difficult to speak after hearing so much. But I would like to also express my solidarity with the families of Mr. Francisco Kiki and Mr. Givaldo Rocha, Quilombola leaders who were murdered in Maranhão, the first in January of 2022, and the second in the month of April this year. I would also like to express my solidarity with the relatives and friends and colleagues and resistance of John Phillips and Bruno Pereira, who, because of their of raising their voices in, in protection of the Amazon and of human rights of minorities, were murdered. And we, as defenders and def defenders of human rights, um, will not be silenced in uh, such barbaric violations of human rights that we see taking place in Brazil. This subject of our parallel event, parallel to the UN Human Rights Council, is fundamentally important because Brazil has been a the stage of a permanent war of the rich against the poor. A war that has murdered, killed, and tortured hundreds and thousands of people. Indigenous, quilombolas, African descendants, black communities, urban favelas have been throughout the history of this country, the colon colonial history, history which began in the uh, 16th century of the Portuguese colonization, a nation which has been systematized, systematically victimized by the state in a plan of extermination. There is no other words or term to express it. It is a war and it's an open war and of extermination in a country that was fo founded on a indigenous genocide, which annihilated cultures, languages, nations, and which continues to do so, which does nothing to protect its people, much to the contrary, has very sophisticated mechanisms of helicopters, armored cars, and police forces. This is a situation that is unprecedented. It is violent, brutal, and it impacts, permanently impacts the lives of those who are left behind. The men, the women, and the children who live their lives in Brazil in a state of exception, in which we have a constitution from 1988, which inaugurated or human rights in the history of the country, 1988, breaking with centuries of total neglect or of openly racist documents and laws and fascist dictatorial legislation. So in 1988, our constitution, which broadens human rights, which recognizes the rights of minorities and the dimensions of human rights, but unfortunately three decades after the approval of our federal constitution, the residents of favelas, of quilombola communities, of indigenous communities, the people of the forests still live in the state of exception in this country. And the speakers who spoke before me, the mothers, they, their testimonies prove this. I live in Maranhão. I was born and raised in Maranhão and I have lived there for 38 years. Maranhão is also a violent state. Data from our state, from the Brazilian annuary of public security show that from 2013 and 2020, there was an increase in the deaths due to police interventions, civil and military interventions of 190%. So in the last year of the research, 6,616 people had been murdered. Um, 
90% uh, which were the black population which is higher even than the brazilian the brazil the brazil population black population which is 56 percent maranhão also occupies of the units in the federation the 17th place in terms of, of death by police interventions and of the 5600 municipalities in brazil são luis the capital of maranhão with a thousand one with 100 million with a million 100,000 inhabitants also has the place is at 45th place in police lethality san luis is a black city it's an amazonian city and it's a city that has been taken by the by police violence it is a black indigenous and black state maranhão state which has also been overcome by police violence and this um violence maranhão doesn't have official registrations we're having so this is a very big problem uh which has been which has been assessed in a recent research by the institute of human rights bruna seems to be having some trouble uh, she can't hear anymore she lost the audio so we know that maranhão has about 829 uh, average of 829 policemen answering for institutional crime and then in 2022 the number was 230. from 2015 to 2021 the police and boots, military police and bootsmen accounted for 970 cases of aggression 229 cases of threats 81 cases of homicide um, 160 cases of home invasion uh 96 cases of torture and 100 and another thousand cases of general police violence just quickly to go over research about recent about local blogs and websites we have learned noticed how severe police violence is in brazil in the state of maranhão on the 29th of june 19th of june the highlight news report young man is murdered in his home by police and according to the family this young man had never been had no criminal history was not involved with crime the military police affirmed that gabriel was highly armed and tried again tried to kill one of the police officers uh, saturday the 18th of june 2022 suspects die in a shootout with the police in the community of achipuri on the 6th of june 2022 military police murders two young people and population protests in the coast of maranhão all of this in the month of june 2022 these are just a few police clip, uh, few newspaper clippings we're still in the month of june and we have information being um, reported in blogs and news saying that the police have at least killed have killed at least five victim victims of police violence a recent case in san luis tainara dos santos young woman was inside of a bus when the bus driver suspected that she and two other people were criminals parked his bus close to a police a military police car in the neighborhood of joan paulo in the state of maranhão um the the young woman was thrown out of the, the car and then was thrown on the floor by the police agents paralyzed while one of the police agents held a, a gun to her face it reminds us of george floyd the case of george floyd and so many other cases of young black people that were murdered breathless by military police we have a history of police violence and brutality that i could go over with you for for hours the last case i want to report was a rural case which happened in august 2020 when a rural community from the balsas municipality about a thousand kilometers from the capital of san luis was removed from their houses by civil police completely against the international 
guidelines of human rights protection. And this was in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic when the guidelines were directing people to stay home. The civil police with lethal weaponry unhoused 23 people, being that 16 of them were elderly above 70 years of age. In fact, one of them was at Parkinson's and after being unhoused, had serious problems of moving their mental health and unfortunately in the year of 2022 passed away. Uh, just to close, I would like to make a few points which have been very clearly um, posed by my speakers before me, but I would like to bring a few more points up for our reflection. And impunity, the lack of criminal investigation and of processes against public agents that kill and murder is central in the lethal violence that has taken control of our country. Rural and urban impunity of police agents and public agents become widespread and has become the practice of the institutions the police agents continue to behave this way because they know they will be protected within the, the forces. We have structural racism in Brazilian country, which attacks indigenous black populations and rural populations in general. Violent racism that kills, annihilates, and keeps this country completely socially unequal. We have complete absence of public policy and mental health for the victims of violence, be it police violence or other forms of violence. In the states or in the nation, there's no legislation that specifically treats or deals with how to adequately punish agents for this behavior. We do not have a policy of reparation for the victims of human rights violations. And many of the cases take years and years in the justice system when the, the, the judges don't condemn or solve things at a local level. You have to go to the Inter-American Court of Human Rights to international contention to try for some reparation. The war on drugs and the policy of uh, insecurity in Brazil, or the security policy in Brazil is another um, factor in this generalized chaos. These arguments are used to destroy social policy that we have seen happen in a structural way ever since the coup of 2016 against President Chuma. Brazilian social tissue is ruptured. Social policy is being annihilated in the country and destroyed. Authorities and the president of the Republic himself have defended human rights violations openly. He has defended torture. This creates an environment of more of a structural violence, brutality, and impunity. And to conclude, the justice system and the public security system in Brazil, except for very few exceptions, is not structured to exercise its, its functions established in the Constitution, which would be to safeguard the rights of human, the human rights of people and the social mediation. But has what we have seen, the justice system and public security system do in general is massive jailing of the black population, impunity of those that kill and torture and the denial of human rights. And this is nothing more in our country than the expression of the domination of a social group over another. We have a long path forward to cause change. So we as human rights defenders will not silence our voices given so much brutality and violations. You will not silence our voices. You will not kill us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Diogo, for your words. Yes. 
Now let's give the floor to uh, Luis Lopes. Bom dia a todos e todas. Good morning to all. I would like to extend my solidarity to the families that have lost their dear relatives, victims of police violence. I want to thank everyone for being here. I want to thank Ulysses Neto and Siobhan Wills for their presence here, for being with us and for supporting this fight. I would like to thank the mothers who have lost their sons for the strength and power for being here. I would also like to thank you for the invitation to be here. And it's an honor to be here representing the Institute of Human Rights and to speak as a researcher on my point of view on this subject and what I've, uh, I have created over time uh, in Brazil and my history in Brazil. Brazil is a country with a deep colonial racist and slave-based culture. Brazilian state was born by organizing um, the punishment and vigilance of the most marginalized and vulnerable communities. And the, when Brazil was still a slave nation, the government, state, and legal systems were combined to form a well-organized machine that served the European interests. And we can see Michel Foucault, for example, assessing some of this. It was during the military dictatorship that in Brazil, from the years 1964 to 1985, the repressive forces of the police and the army um, have acquired their markedly repressive and violent forces. These forces were trained to combat the left and they were modeled around specific characteristics. The first is the creation of the military police trained not only to police um, their, their police stations, but also public roads and repressible society. And here, when I say military, I'm referring not only to the internal structure of military police organization, which is reproduced in the hierarchy of the army and is subordinate to it. But I'm refer referring specifically to the modus operandi of fighting its enemies. When a military uh, force faces its enemies, it identifies and eliminates them physically. That's the way the police go about facing or fighting their enemies. This is one of the main characteristics of the police forces in Brazil is that they are organized as a weapon of war and used against the civil society and population in Brazil. It's important that I also highlight that even civil police in Brazil uh, operates in a militarized fashion, as Diogo mentioned in many of the speakers before me. Even if the internal structures do not follow the military hierarchy of the army, their modus operandi uh, is strongly militarized and guided by the same values and principles that guide the military police, which is identifying enemies in the population and then eliminating them. The biggest police operation in Brazil was the police operation in Favela do Jacarezinho. The manslaughter of 28 people in Favela do Jacarezinho was organized by COPRI, a coordinatorship of special ops in the state of Rio de Janeiro. They operationalized uh, the weapon of war of the police forces to identify and eliminate enemies in that community. And it is through this type of operation that, the Brazil, that Brazil accumulates more and more stories and cases of these manslaughters. Unfortunately, recently in the month of May, we had two other cases of the police being used as a weapon of war against its population. The execution of Genival Santos was killed in a police car which was used as a gas chamber where the doors were closed and the man was gassed to death. The operation of the police uh, uh, police forces in the Peña community recently, where more than 20 people were also murdered, many with knife stabs from police agents. The state of Maranhão, the police in general are no different than in the rest of the country data on police lethality that is organized and published by the Maranhense Society of Human Rights has shown persistence of the high levels of police brutality in Maranhão. Just to give you one example, in January 2019, in an operation in Vila Conceição, in the periphery of San Luis, 
capital of Marayom, eight people were murdered by the police. Recently, also on the 2nd of June, the military police in Marayon executed two young people in broad daylight in the city of Ituriana. The case was registered on people's cell phones. Fortunately, these cases have become commonplace in Brazil, especially in the state of Marayon. Data in the bulletins and the color of the violence, uh, well, the report, color of violence uh, produced by the Institute I'm a part of, um, points that police violence Brazil specifically pointed against the black populations in Salvador, Fortaleza and Recife, three big capitals in the Northeast. During 2020, 100% of people murdered in police operations were black people. The Secretary of Security in Marayon doesn't take note of people's race or color, which causes a total blackout of the data and makes race and gender invisible in uh, police brutality data. Police violence is um, specifically directed at the youth of the peripheries and favelas in literature and cinema and in music, specifically rap music, uh, different versions of funk and trap music. We see the youth of the peripheries of this nation associating the image of the police with death, fear, authoritarianism, amongst other very negative uh, characteristics which identify the state of police violence in the peripheries of Brazil, specifically pointing its guns against the black youth of the communities. To understand this civil war against the poor and the black of Brazil, you need to understand the policy of what is called the war on drugs. Ever since the military dictatorship, Brazil has adhered to the prohibitionist doctrine pro, pro, promoted by the United States in relation to drugs, maintaining the consumption circulation under strong police repression. An important part of the Brazilian police apparatus, which was set up during military dictatorship and used against leftist politicians, was then reallocated to the war on drugs. Uh, uh, considering the exposure of the cocaine market in the country in the beginning of the 80s. Ever since then, police legislation and apparatus was produced and posed against the war, uh, for in, in favor of the war on drugs. But we can see from what our colleagues and, and the mother shared of us is that the exclusive targets of this repression are usually the smallest retailers in the chain that establish small drug stores in favelas or peripheral communities in Maranhão and Rio So we see that this repressive authoritarian apparatus is used against the final users or the smallest sellers. So small drug dealers are targets of, of very violent police operations. The war on drugs in Brazil is the main state argument for keeping the Brazilian favelas militarized uh, against the context of repressing traffic, uh, drug traffic. Um, war op warlike operations are executed in the peripheries and favelas, causing violence, suffering, pain, and death for these communities. The war on drugs in Brazil is actually a war on the poor, a war on the black community, and a war on the favelados. As was said before, it produces a state of exception in the peripheries of Brazil, in the favelas of Brazil, where there are no constitutional guarantees for example, the presumption of innocence is completely ignored, the inviolability of people's households and homes, and the right to life, rights which are completely disrespected. The black youth of the country are the targets of these police investigations and lethal operations in Rio de Janeiro. This situation goes far beyond. As we can see by these reports, we can consider that what happens in Rio state terrorism. These are war operations which submit entire populations to terror and have become routine in that state. So heavily armed police that go up, up, up favelas in armored vehicles, choppers flying over people's houses using war tanks to circulate through the streets and monitor those um, regions. That's why we can see that there is severe uh, mental pain in these com com communities, as Professor Siobhan Wills has said, panic, fear, terror are consistently reported by people who have been through state terrorism. 
the music of the peripheries also tells us this story and it talks about the mental depreciation and losses neurosis is consistently reported in rap songs rap funk and trap music call this constant state of worry with violence that may may erupt at any moment as a state of neurosis paranoia panic and fear are also consistently reported in rap songs i would also like to emphasize that one of the most severe faces of state violence in rio de janeiro is the penitentiary system and here i would like to say that in the last few years i've been a professor and a researcher in prisons in the prison system and i was able to see firsthand the structural violence which organizes the prison system and how this violence um has strong ripple effects in what I call the dialectics between the jails and peripheries promoted by mass incarceration. Especially over the last two decades, um, the prison population in the country has grown in multiples thanks to the war on drugs, which is in fact the war on the poor, as we know. The profile of the prison population in general is exactly the same as the victims of police lethality. The young black people, of the favelas with low levels of education. This population is then submitted to the torturous conditions of Brazilian prisons, which are marked by uh, terrible sanitary conditions where there are uh, abound reports of torture, ill treatments, and by prisoners as well as the guards, the police guards. Pedrinhas is a very sad example of the deplorable situation of the Brazilian jails, which has been denounced at the Inter-American Court of Human Rights by the Maranhense Society of Human Rights. This prison, oh, well, the society has been reporting on the massacres, which happened in 2013 and 2014, and the persistent situation of human rights violations taking place at the, in prisons. Mass incarceration by the uh, as as long as well as the terrible situation of Brazilian prisons is one of the main reasons for the criminal operations which were born in the prisons by Comando Vermelho, PCC, Primeiro Comando do Cap Capital, and in Maranhão, the Primeiro Comando do Maranhão, and the Bonde dos Quarenta, criminal organizations that were born in the complex, the the, the jail of Pedrinhas. Over the last few years, I have dedicated myself to try to understand the dynamics of these well, criminal organizations that were born in jails and then moved into the peripheries and took control of the favelas of the country. This is all what characterizes a historical phenomenon in Brazilian society in terms of police violence that is directed at the poor communities. But it's important that I highlight here and here I will close that once Bolsonaro came to the government and the far right came to the government, things have gotten much worse because they, Bolsonaro officially gave a green light to these sectors of society. The president of Brazil has already admitted publicly that he is favor in favor, favorable to torture, to extermination groups, as well as other political practices, which are so common in Brazil. This, this has already been, the, the press has already been able to prove that he is also directly connected to the connected to the militias dominating the favelas. So the situation of state violence in Brazil today uh, must conclude uh, defeating the extreme right and its necropolitics. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Louise, for your words. I have been following your, and, and I agree with the, the need to, to to defeat the far right in this country and remove the genocidal the genocide from power. Let's uh, now have the questions and and answers. Let me uh, present the speakers with the first question. Uh, it's a general question to all of you, and the question is: uh, What could be done by the uh, Brazilian state? as well as the organized civil society uh, to solve the problem of militarized policing and its negative effects uh, on the mental health of residents of marginalized communities uh, in Brazil. 
Okay, so we can go to Bruna. Bruna, can you answer that question about what could be done? Hi, I'm still here. Do you want me to repeat the question? Would you mind, please? Would you please repeat it? So, in your opinion, what could be done by the state, Brazilian state, as well as civil society, organized civil society, to solve the problem of police brutality in the favelas or the effects that it causes on the um, mental health of the residents of the communities in Rio de Janeiro, Maranhão, etc. So what do you think the state could do or civil society could do to solve the situation? I don't know if I could answer that question. It's, it's very broad, but I, I think that we need to step on the brakes of the state. So monitoring the state, the state does not want to be monitored or audited, but they need to be monitored because as was said, this is not a war on trucks. It's a war against the poor black people of the favelas. So society needs to start opening its eyes and removing the blinds of its eyes we need society on our side because society sees us as the as criminals. We need society to fight to help us with our rights. So we say, like we like to say in the favelas, we don't have any um, factories that are making weapons and we don't have plantations of drugs. These things come from outside the favela into the favela. And why don't they repress it at the beginning of the chain of production? So before coming into the favela to repress us, they should start working outside of the favelas at the borders. That's where they should be repressing or enacting the war on drugs. Why are they letting these things go through the borders and then come here? Because they would rather come here, kill the young people in the favelas and say that, you know, oh, these were stray bullets. Society needs to stop believing in this terrible discourse that there is such a thing as stray bullets. When the state is present in a community, these bullets are not stray. They are directly targeted at our bodies. So I think opening our eyes as society, we are here to say that our bodies matter, that our lives matter, and that we're not going to accept death. We want to thank the UN and thank you for listening to us and for helping us raise our voices uh, at a global level. I hope that together we can do something to make this a better reality. And I hope that love can can beat the, the hate and that we can remove this genocidal fascist from power because he is rooting these ideals in society. Today, the violence is in the favela, but it, soon it will be at your door. So also helping to halt the violence at the favelas is will help to decrease violence at the level of all of society. So if it wasn't for police violence in all of the Brazilian society, then Marcos Vinicius, Jonatas, and Agatha would still be here with us today. Oh. As a mother, how can we educate our children if even when they're going to school, they're being, there are stray bullets directed at them. So let's deconstruct the idea that these bullets are innocent or stray. We are here raising our voices. I have a, a daughter still, and we'll keep fighting for her. Thank you, Bruna. Ana Paula, please. Um, but I think it's what Bruna said, but just to add something, I think that we're, you know, time is up. This facing the structural racism is extremely important. This racism is rooted deep in our society. And unfortunately, facing this impunity, it's the impunity that strengthens them to to think that they can come up here and do whatever they want and they will never be punished. So the police impunity is what needs to be targeted. The policeman that murdered my son had already, was already answering for triple homicide, three different attempts of homicide, and he was still here. He was still confident that he could 
shoot at whoever he wanted. So the certainty of impunity is what strengthens the officers to behave as they please, to be uh, so uncareful. And I think that to end impunity, we need to, you know, hold not only the people that are that are shooting the guns responsible, but the structured, organized crime of the state. So the commanders that are targeting their policies against us. The state needs to be held accountable as a whole. And when I say state, I mean Secretary of Public Security, the governor of Rio. I mean, they're the state. They're the ones who, who plan the operations and do nothing about they do nothing to preserve the lives of the population of their own state, the poor black population. So obviously inequality needs to be faced as a whole, but impunity of police forces should not be something that society ignores, turns a blind eye towards. We know that when a murder happens, you know, when the police abroad murder someone, for example, George Floyd, the Brazilian population becomes so moved. It seems like we are already used to losing Brazilian lives in Brazil. We seem to forget that every three minutes, a young black um, person is murdered by the police in Brazil. And then when something happens outside of Brazil, everyone becomes moved and moves to the streets because they have become um, numb to the loss of our own lives. I'm not saying that we should not be moved when someone loses their life abroad. Of course we should. We are in favor of life for all, but we don't see Brazilian society becoming um, touched or in, um, becoming requesting the justice for the death in our country. So, you know, this society also needs to be held responsible for these deaths. So I think it's time for society at the level of mass population and um, public opinion to start taking a stand in favor of the indigenous population of the poor of the black of the favela of the people who are being victimized murdered and whose rights are violated so i think society should take a stand thank you ana paula and bruna human rights defender meeting has just joined oh we have a tiny human rights defender who just joined us here so these are some things that happen but she's gonna join us here we know she's a future human rights please Siobhan the word is with you hi and hello Cecilia good to see you good to see you defending human rights um to the first in answering this question is there are already, as we've heard from Anna Paula, Vanessa and Bruna, and many other mothers and many other people fighting and struggling for change. So there already is an organization pushing for change there and they are doing so very powerfully and strongly. I think that they need to be supported in, uh, in helping to change the narrative globally and nationally to to make it clear to, well, first of all, to counter the criminalization of the people killed. There is always this narrative of presented by the police and the state that uh, whoever is killed is killed because of something they did. When it is very clear that people are being killed because they live in a neighborhood and the, the, the neighborhood is being destroyed. And I think that moves me to the next point that we need to draw on that narrative that the whole neighborhood has been targeted. It's a war on that neighborhood and the international community and the national press and the national human rights organizations need to focus their attention on the holistic harms that are being done to that community and look at uh, human rights violations the whole spectrum of human rights violations with the aim of ensuring that everybody, whatever neighborhood they live in, has a right to live in freedom and dignity, that they have, they should not fear that one day there's going to be an armored vehicle in their street. There should never be an armored vehicle in a de densely populated neighborhood. It should never happen. Whatever drugs might, might be going on, there should not. And someone should be saying, and it should be human rights defenders, it should be the UN human rights organizations, the inter-American human rights organizations, 
and the local press, what is an armored vehicle doing in the middle of a densely populated nation, neighborhood with cannon guns? Why is there a sniper there? There should never be. It is in itself, even if nobody is killed, it's a violation of people's human rights because of the trauma and terror and the potential that your life, you're no longer free if there's a helicopter con constantly flying over your head. And I think that is what we need to push for. Uh, there are many other things that we need to push for too. About, an end to impunity, an end to the release of policemen by uh, pardoning when finally one or two get uh, convicted. Uh, most of them never get convicted because the cases take too long and uh, evidence is suppressed. That too must be dealt with. But the government needs to, and the state and, and all of us that are working for change, need to focus on the holistic, on the war that is being uh, fought against communities and campaign for everybody to live in freedom. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Shivon. Uh, Joe, por favor. É, nós temos um grande desafio. A great challenge ahead. A challenge which is very much connected to the system, as a public security system. <coughs> we certainly have a deficit of justice. There is a, a well, a need for condemnations for um, in, uh, these agents to not go to not be, question the impunity of the police forces. But there are so many cases. That is one of the things that is used against the victims. The fact that there are so many cases like this. So it's fundamental that the state start um, constituting independent bodies independent monitoring bodies that can in fact audit the forces and investigate what it is that happens or investigate crime different levels so today currently it's the same police that murders is the police that investigates those cases of death i mean we're not talking about vengeance here we want justice so we can't expect you know partial justice is not justice it's injustice so it's fundamental that given the impunity and the crimes that are committed by the police, the military police, the civil police, that the that these this be investigated by independent bodies. So that is a very um, concrete um, uh, answer that needs to be given by the state. Another aspect is the reparatory reparation for victims, not only reparation in terms of symbolic recognition, but in fact real reparation. So. Um, based on what the par the relatives are asking for. For example, Eduardo brought very interesting points related to the, the Pedrinhas prison. The people who were murdered in the Pedrinhas prison and who, who came to the state asking for reparation. So there are cases that happened in 2013 and that are waiting to till today for the judgment of their civil um, cases so that are you know in the courts until today so we need a rep a policy for public reparation for victims a public policy where the state in fact um, commits to reparation of the victims the way they request or see fit another point we need to think of is public policy of, of mental health so we do not have public policy of mental health people that are victims relatives of the people who, well relatives who have lost they have their public, their their mental health totally degraded, and like the two clips that that Professor Chivon showed, these people live precarious lives after the loss of a relative, and we do not have any public policy for mental health. We do have a policy for health for public health, but not mental health to ensure some sort of a support system and care for the people that are victims of this violence. We do not have a public policy for mental health, the public health, the mental health also of human rights defenders that are being threatened, um, brutally threatened. We don't have a policy for, for protecting these people's mental health. So these are three points that are um, 
objective. They obviously will not on their own solve the issues in their totality. But I think based on these three points, we would be able to form a minimum program to begin discussing this. Obviously, we need to face very structural issues like ending the war on drugs. That's a, a debate that needs to happen in Brazil. But and also the demilitarization of police forces. So we need to discuss this in Brazil. Police structures in Brazil are still military dictatorship structures from the military dictatorship. Military courts are also a damned inheritance of the military dictatorship. And if we don't start deconstructing these instances from a democratic point of view and discussing this also from the point of view of the state of, uh, of law, then we will just continue to reproduce the degrading human rights violating practices, which unfortunately have become commonplace in this country. So I think we have some transitional points on the agenda in Brazil, and then we have to also talk about the, the root problems. I hope that in Brazil we are able to face the structural racism and that the next federal government can be capable also of raising these questions of civil society. So these are fundamental points. Thank you, Diogo. Luis, please, if you can also mention your opinion about the use of cameras uh, and, and police, uh, police wearing cameras. Thank you, Ulises. Um, I think that what my colleagues have mentioned are really the fundamental points. But I would like to add or emphasize a few of these points. First of all, I want to say that, you know, uh, facing uh, the extreme right, it cannot be done only at the level of the elections. We need to face the agenda of fascism in Brazil, not only just uh, vote against them uh, in October. We have to remember that the ideology of the extreme right in Brazil is, is usually a fascist um, policy in public security. That's usually what gets them elected. They're anti-human rights discourse. So um, obviously, you know, electing a more progressive government this year is very important. We're going to all be voting on governors and, and representatives and presidents, etc. But we have to also hold our candidates accountable, hold the ones that we have elected and the ones that we believe that will in fact help us to, to fight the agenda of public security the way it is right now. So we need a public security policy, which is human rights based. So the, even the progressive, um, progressive activists in Brazil have a, 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 a hard time facing this. So we see governments abroad that are, are very progressive in terms of education, but when it comes to public security, they don't have the courage to to say anything about that. So we know it's taboo to talk about being progressive in security. That's that's taboo in Brazil, even with the progressive forces of the left. So we need to start raising this subject. And within the field of public security, I would also mention two main points that Giogo and my other colleagues already mentioned also, which is the issue of the war on drugs. I think it's urgent to revisit this policy. As we know, it's no, it's not a war on drugs. It's a war on specific communities and peripheries or entire communities, as Professor Siobhan called our attention to. So war on drugs is one of the main points and also mass incarceration in Brazil. In Brazil, too many people are arrested and then thrown into jail and it badly arrested. If we look at, if we study the profile of the, of the, the car, uh, prison population in Brazil, we'll see that there are very few homicide, uh, homicidal criminals or murderers. M mainly the prison population is made up of people of small drug dealers or even thieves and um, petty crimes. So the more we put people in jail in Brazil, in these very violent prisons, the more the violence outside of the prisons increases because when these people leave the prisons, they're in fact heavy, heavier criminals. They're connected to criminal networks, sometimes much 
more serious networks than they were even connected to when they were jailed. So the penitentiary system needs to be deeply reformed and Brazil as well, rethought of and questioned. About police cameras, um, this has been a very efficient measure for social control abroad and, and has helped to control the police behavior a lot. But as was said in the chat by someone, this camera is only being used by the military police in some states, Sao Paulo, I believe, and a few other states. But we need to remember that civil police also are operating in a military fashion. So they need the same monitoring. It's not enough to just monitor military police because military fashion is not just, you know, having a general or uh, a military hierarchy of the army. The essence of militarization is not the military hierarchy. The, the essence of the ideology of militarization is to act to eliminate enemies, to murder. So to operate as a weapon of war, that is the at essence what militarization is. That's what needs to be demilitarized. So it's not just, you know, taking apart the internal structure of the police. I mean, that's a part of it, but that's not the essential part. The essential part is demilitarizing the modus operandi of the forces on the streets. Um, that's what needs to be demilitarized. And I am obviously totally in favor of the cameras um, in police forces uniforms i think it has been show, been proving itself to be a very efficient um, means to monitoring the police and it needs to be to be evolved even so these um images need to be used for public um control by the population so you know i think we need to continue getting the order of lawyers the bar association involved with this so that they can fight for the external control of the police forces because a lot of times what happens in brazil is that police violent police officers are controlled let's say or they have their behavior um monitored by other police agents so we know that there is an internal respect system in the corporation which doesn't allow for the true responsibility or punishment of the agents so no one is ever punished so we need to create external mechanisms for monitoring these forces and where there can in fact be an external social control of the forces. Police cannot be monitored or controlled by the forces themselves, but by civil society as a whole. I think that's my main contribution. Thank you. Thank you. We go to the conclusions. May I ask you to, in one sentence, say or answer the question, why do you do what you do uh, at the risk of your own life, your own family's uh, well-being? You do what you do. So why do you do it? Uh, in one sentence or two, perhaps. Uh, por favor, a uh, Bruna. Please, if Bruna would like to start. I would like to say that I do it for my children so we, we do it so we can prove that these these children continue to have their mothers i do it for life the right to live she won't i am i'm not in danger of my life so it's a very different story i do it because i admire and respect the courage of uh, those who are fighting in the context where they are threatening their lives are threatened and they are protecting their families but also because it's the right thing to do and because the international community has a responsibility to respond. And we that work in the international community of human rights have a responsibility to raise our voices. Uh, I would like to use the slogan of the Maranhense Society of Human Rights. We do it in defense of life. Luis. It's going to be hard for me to summarize this in a sentence, but I'll try to be as quick as I can. I was born in the periphery when I was young. I lived in a favela and I, um, my, uh, I was also the victim of a stray bullet. So when I was 16, actually a relative was lost 
and my family suffered a lot of this. I spent, oh, oh no, I myself suffered a stray bullet. So I spent seven months in the ICU and my family was very much affected. So this violent, hap um, this violent uh, happening in the poor community of, of periphery of San Luis marked my life and I think shaped my life. This is a fundamental happening uh, in my life. And I would hope that my child and my relatives could all live in a place where no one would have to suffer a stray bullet by police forces. So I think that that's what personally moves me, my life, my story, and also seeing other people who like Bruno, who want to like Ana Paula, like Vanessa, who despite the difficulty, keep fighting. Uh, given the time limit, I'm afraid we have to come to an end of this constructive uh, event. But before I go, let me say, uh, that I would like to thank uh, Maranhão Human Rights Society, Ulster University, Goiás State University, uh, Diogo Cabral, Luiz Eduardo, Chivon Wills, Ana Paula Oliveira, Bruna da Silva, Vanessa Salles, uh, Clara Connolly for the interpretation, uh, Alan Maiden for setting up the Zoom room, and all uh, participants, uh, please stay safe, Stay strong, keep up the good fight, and if you are in Brazil and you can vote, vote against this uh, extreme right. It's uh, not enough just to get rid of uh, the genocide, the disgraced president, but uh, it's a, a first step. So let's do it and keep fighting for human rights. It's uh, the only way you can you can do. I mean, at the moment in Brazil, keep up the good fight. Thank you all and. Uh, Hope we can, you know, meet again soon enough. Thank, Thank you. you, Ulysses. Thank you all.